afternoon, everyone. So you had a great introduction this morning by Mustafa Kamash on uh, cybergenetics, so how we can try to connect cells and computers to try to uh, control and pilot their, their functions. Uh, and so the goal of uh, my, my one hour talk today is to actually try to show you a few examples uh, of what we can do with this and what we can learn uh, with this. Um, so just before we, I, I start in the cyber genetics uh, kind of experiments, I just wanted to comment on, on what, what I, might, I am interested in and what the team is, is doing here. So basically what we're interested in is also connected to what you saw this morning with uh, Yannick Rondelet. It's how do cells process information. It's really something that we, we think there is something deep here. Uh, cells are overly complex biomachines. They, they actually can produce thousands of proteins and all these proteins, they confer many different uh, abilities to the cell. And so very, very complex ones like the possibility to replicate DNA, the possibility to duplicate themselves. Uh, and of course, this is not a trivial process. Okay. And so what, what physicists do when they try to understand a black box or a very complex system, uh, and it also comes down to what Mustafa was showing this morning, it's, it's a dead end to try to model the system in full details, to try to measure all the kinetic parameters of all these thousands of proteins in interaction. Um, what you can try to do is to look at uh, how this system can react when you subject it to different inputs, especially time varying inputs, and see how information is processed, so how you can relate the output to the input. And so this kind of thing, when you do this, and this is what physicists have done for all kinds of systems, including biological ones uh, recently, uh, what you hope is to try to learn something on the system. So uh, the kind of thing that we are doing in the lab and the thing that we will, sh will show you today is mostly on two different organisms, so yeast and bacteria. Here you can see yeast growing, you can see how you can make a real-time image analysis on this. And usually we don't simply look at them like this, we look at them in microfluidic devices. So here you can see one example where cells grow in a flat monolayer, so they are constrained by the, the system. And actually uh, you can then play with different environments to make this periodic stimulation. So you can decide what kind of fluid you want to send to the cells, do this in function of time, and look at how cells uh, react in function of, uh, of these changes. And so, of course, we can look at different outputs. Uh, there are every possible output you can think of, and I'm just showing you some of them, which are the most physical. So here you can see yeast cells which are reacting to hyperosmotic stress. So you see them ch change their size. It's mostly because you have water going uh, out and inside the cell to mechanically answer to osmotic stress. So this happens typically in 30 seconds for the period. It's a relatively fast time scale. Here you see the same yeast cells with a bright dot appearing. So this bright dot is a, uh, the localization of a protein called OG1. And we will come back to this protein briefly later. And we can uh, again look at how fast this protein can enter when you send a periodic stress. And what you can see here is a kind of measurement you can do. So this is basically how uh, this protein is, is going to faithfully follow the input signal in function of the frequency. And you end up to something which is trivial, that cells behave like low-pass filters. So if you send them very, very fast signal, they will actually not be able to follow this input and they, they will average it out, so they will not respond at all. Uh, and if you send something which is relatively slow, they will be able to follow and to faithfully reproduce the, the input you send. And of course, the question is uh, slow and fast, and this is, uh, uh, doesn't mean anything. It's slow compared to something, or fast compared to something. And so you have what is called a critical frequency, which also defines uh, bandwidth, so how much information a cell can process. And, and this bandwidth or critical frequency depends on the biochemical reaction of the different uh, proteins which are at play. So just doing this, measuring this, you end up with a number, a time scale, which tells you something on what's going on inside the cell. So you, you can continue, you can do other stuff, and so you can look at more complex systems than just a localization of a protein. So here what you look at is cells growing. So you just count how many cells you have in the field of view, and they grow in 
in average, the same environment. Okay, if you average out over the, the time, you will see everything. I mean, all cells will grow in the same environment, but the period of the stress will change. So this is fast osmotic stress, slow osmotic stress. And what you can end up with, I mean, very, you can make the proper quantification, but what is clear here is that you have more cells here than here. All the time scales are the same, meaning that cells grow better when they are subjected to slow osmotic stress than when they are selected to fast osmotic stress. Again, low pass filter, and we could uh, discuss about this. I'm just giving you uh, this as an example to illustrate the kind of exper experiment we are doing in the lab. And actually, yes, way better. Sorry, I am allowed to remove my mask. Wow. Um, but it's not always low pass filter, okay? It's not always that trivial. So another example, it's the same experiment than before, except this time, what we are varying is the glucose frequency, okay? So this time when you send very, very fast, fast again, compared to how fast the cells can process information, uh, glucose uh, fluctuation, the cells are growing relatively happily when, when you don't, when you send uh, repeated glucose starvation period, uh, which are slow in frequency, then they don't grow that much. Okay, so you end up, so you can compare, so typically these are the two response in terms of how many uh, of growth rate of cells in either in blue osmotic stress or in orange uh, glucose variation. And for all of these uh, um, perturbations, the cells are able to actually, I mean, they, they have hard coded in their genome by evolution, a kind of response, a kind of uh, low pass filter that drives this. So we, this is a kind of experience we have been doing for some time. And at one point, uh, actually a long time ago now, and this probably the same kind of, uh, I mean, a, a bit after Mustafa was already uh, playing with uh, the first ideas of cyber genetics, we started to think, okay, this is good to measure this low-pass filter behavior. We can estimate time scales. We can learn something. We can also do the same thing with mutations. But to what extent can we go a bit beyond this and, and not really look at the input-output uh, system, but, but, but close the loop? And so ask a slightly different kind of question. It's not this relationship, which I will be interested in now, but am I able to actually, am I clever enough to plug a computer here that will measure the output and do something in the input so that the output stay constant? And um, so for those who were there this morning, and I hope everyone was there this morning to listen to Mustafa, uh, this is a problem of the control controllability of a system. Uh, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, I am an experimentalist, so I, I don't know exactly to what extent a cell is controllable or not. I'm not even sure if we can ask this question properly. But what we can do is to try. Okay? And uh, what I'm going to show you here is three examples. I hope I will have time to do the three examples, which are going to, to be, in, I mean, maybe not more and more complex, but which are going to address different kind of controllability issues. So the first one, it's relatively basic, is to say, OK, I'm going to look at the expression of one gene. I will tag this gene with a fluorescence reporter, and I will just monitor fluorescence over cells. And I, will, I know that this uh, specific gene, I know how to activate it. I will send an osmotic stress. And I will try to see if I can control this gene at a given level of fluorescence. Relatively simple. We'll see it's not actually that trivial. Then we'll go to a different uh, kind of problem, which is this time it's not an endogenous behavior. It's a, a synthetic system. So this is a sketch of what is called the toggle switch. Toggle switch is the bistable system. It's the first genetic toggle switch. is the first bistable system that was uh, made by Gardner and Collins in the year 2000, actually. One of the first great examples of uh, synthetic biology. Um, and so this is bistable. So to what extent can we actually force the system to not commit to one of its two stable states, but to remain unstable? Okay, so we'll try to see uh, how we can do this. And the last one is more recent, uh, and, and I think very interesting also, is to what extent are we able to control not one cell, but actually a population of cells? And each of them uh, has their own kind of uh, problems in terms of how we can, we can uh, set up experimentally as a control system. Um, okay, and of course, you can interrupt me whenever you want. Uh, I will be happy to stop whatever I'm showing and to try to answer your questions. Uh, okay, 
So first thing, relatively simple, you take a gene, you know that when you send an hyperosmotic stress, so basically you add sugar or you add salt into your environment, you know that there is several genes which are expressed and you want to control one, okay? Apparently simple. The interesting part of it, the problem of controllability here, is, is this is not a synthetic circuit, okay? When you deal with the hyperosmotic uh, response, you deal actually with this kind of system, which is already uh, uh, inside the cells, I mean, yeast cells are able to answer to hyperosmotic stress. And so you see plenty of stuff. So you have a CLN cascade with uh, different, uh, what is called MAP kinase cascade, actually, uh, different proteins that are here to convey information. Uh, you have gene expression uh, and uh, so uh, different, actually, gene expression. You have the metabolism here. So all metabolism of cell is at play in this response. The cell cycle is also arrested. So actually, the question I'm asking is not can we control the expression of the fluorescent gene, which is relatively trivial. The question is can we control a gene despite the fact that this very gene is at the heart of this. So it's already regulated and there are already many, many feedback loops in there. So can we hijack this feedback loop? Can we overcome them and take control over this? So I was talking about feedback loop, just to give you a few words on how, how it works. Uh, so yeast are in nature, I mean, they are very often confronted to uh, hyperosmotic stress. Uh, so hyperosmotic stress happens every time you have a change of salinity, for example. Okay, so if you imagine that there is a bit of evaporation, you have more ions, more sugar in, your, in the media in which your, your, your yeast are growing, and so it's, it creates a stress. Yeah. And it has been a model of interest uh, for, for some time, and including on how does it work. And it works in a very simplified way. So this is from a beautiful paper in, uh, by uh, Van Udenarden and colleagues in 28, 29, something like this. I'm sorry, I forgot to put the reference here. Uh, which you can actually see that this is shown as a feedback loop. Okay, This is something which is coded by the cells, but we try to analyze it as a feedback loop system. And what happens is that you have an osmolarity. This is sensed somehow by the cell, signaled to the nucleus. And then you have this arrow that goes back here, which is called glycerol accumulation. What it hides, it hides the fact that genes are expressed, typically GPD-1. This gene is going to take whatever glucose is in the cell and transform it into glycerol. Glycerol will increase the osmotic pressure inside the cell. And so the cell will recover its volume and will adapt. And so this, this is, I think, one of the first examples of perfect adaptation. I mean, there are others, but in sealing pathways, I think it's a, it's a beautiful example of perfect adaptation, integral feedback, adapt, I mean, feedback loop uh, in, uh, in the cell. So what we are going to do, still, we are going to try to hijack the system to control a, a gene. So we take a uh, microfluidic system, so it's not the same sketch in the one I showed you before, but it's the same strategy. Cells are sandwiched in very small channels here, and you can uh, flow uh, medium in the two large channels here. You can follow them in time, you can segment them, you can measure the fluorescence in each individual cells. So you have a way to, to measure the output. And what we are going to do is to then try to decide with a very basic model how we send hyperosmotic stress to the cells. So this is something that uh, Mustafa had not time to show this morning, but this morning we talked about PID, so this proportional integral derivative controller. Of course, there are other means to control. So this one, it's called model predictive control. So you, you, you need actually to have a basic model of the system, not a perfect one. You don't need a perfect model. And in a sense, what happens is what is here, you try to reach this target value, which is a dashed line here. So this is a fluorescence value in arbitrary unit. You look at where you are. You look also at what happened in the past, and you use this uh, initial condition to simulate your model over time. Okay. So you project it in time, and you look what would be the best input to actually, given this model, get you closer to this uh, dash curve. So in a, in, in a sense, this actually creates a feedback loop. Okay. Um, so you can set that up, and, and you'll see already now that there is a, this, which is a way we send stresses, and this is actually where the experimental part on controllability comes. Okay, we don't send sustained and long hyperosmotic stress. If we were to do that, it would mean that the cells were able to adapt. 
So if they adapt, they don't feel the stress and, and you end up with a system that is not responsive anymore. We actually put additional constraints, okay, which are from our understanding of how the cell works, and which means that we only send short pulses of osmotic stress and we make sure that between two successive pulses there is a rest, a resting period. So we always put back the cell in a regular condition, which somehow resets its osmotic uh, state so that it is always responsive to the stress that we send. Uh, and it does something like this. So this is the work of Yanis Ullendorf. We are, in, we are a long time ago. We are almost 10 years ago. It's, it's, uh, it's, really, it's going very, very fast. Um, so we, we, do, we do better now in terms of image analysis and everything. But, so this is an experiment where we don't do much, okay, except starting the experiment. Um, you want to reach this target value. So what does want to reach this target value? It's the average fluorescence. So we measure fluorescence in all cells. And uh, we let the computer, using this model predictive control, decide where and when to send uh, these, uh, these pulses. So what the computer decides is the duration of a pulse. When it's yellow, it's five minutes. When it's red, it's eight minutes. And any color, it's in between. And uh, when to send this. Okay, you, you can see that some, some, sometimes there is no pulses sent at all. And so it works. It's nice. You are actually able. I mean, it seems easy and uh, uh, straightforward now. But at the time, we were absolutely not, not sure it will be working. And actually, before we found these constraints, uh, we had many different uh, failures, uh, uh, cool ones. But uh, still, we failed many times before finding this uh, this trick. Which the message for me is to say that you can actually uh, force a system, even a biological system, which is known to to be uh, I mean, full of feedback loops, and you have a very partial knowledge of how it works dynamically. Again, it's thousands of proteins interacting together, so we don't have a picture of how it works. And in such situation, we actually, this is something important, we will never, I mean, never, at least right now, we don't have much uh, things to observe. What we can get in real time is one fluorescent gene, maybe two, three, four, if you start to be clever I mean, regarding fluorescence microscopy, you can have the size, the growth rate, but this is, this is almost, I mean, all you can do, okay? So you will never have a complete state of your cellular system at a given, at a given time, which would actually make a way, I mean, control way easier in a sense. So then you can play with it, please. Eight. Uh, and the yellow bar is five. Oh, okay. So you have, you have from time to time, you see, so typically this one is shorter than the others. And it can be, uh, I mean, this one is orange. I mean, it, it, I mean, this one is clear orange. It's okay, really... No, 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 no. The, 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 the computer decides by itself. Uh, okay, so it can be any number between... Yes. And we don't, I don't claim we optimize it. I mean, maybe if you take four and nine minutes, it would be in working better. I mean, this is, this was not really the point. What is sure is that if you don't put restrictions of the duration of the pulse, uh, the controller does what, what every human would do. I mean, you, you start from zero, you want to reach uh, a high level. So you would turn your knob maximum and stay there. And you will see your white curve rising and then cells will start adapting. And so it will, it, it will decrease. And a controller is, is still something, uh, a PID, for example, is something stupid. So if it sees the signal decreasing, the only thing it can do is to make sure that it sustains activation. So it will try to amplify it and, 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 uh, and continue having a sustained activation, which will, uh, which will fail inevitably. And the off state, is, there's a, a minimum size of off state? There is a minimum size of off state, yes. Okay. Uh, which I don't, again, I don't think this is absolutely needed. But at one point, it's, it comes back to the problem of low pass filter. So when you send very, very short pulses, they, they are not necessarily seen by the cell. So we could have uh, placed them here, but they will not actually see them in a sense. So you can play with it. You can look at uh, how it works at different, uh, different target value. And uh, why I'm showing you this, it's not really for the fact that you can look at different target values to show 
you what is uh, uh, biological data when you try to control. So the, the robot that Mustafa showed this morning, when, when it's, it's standing, uh, in, in, I mean, it's in inverted position in a sense, I mean, straight, it's standing straight, okay? It's not in different things. Here, what you have, the, the blue curve is actually the average and you have plus minus one standard deviation when you look at all cells, okay? So of course you can control the average relatively well, but you have a lot of noise, okay? So still, you don't control very precisely one cell. So if you, were to, if you want to control every cell and to try to reduce this, uh, this area, then the strategy you need to, to, to try, I'm not sure it will work, but probably, is what Mustafa showed you this morning, is to start considering that each cell needs its own feedback loop control. And so for this, you need optogenetics to address uh, each cell independently uh, from, from their neighbors, which we don't do here. And I will not mention optogenetics uh, maybe I will mention it, but I will not show you anything into genetics uh, in my talk. So that was one, one, one system. And so the take home message is that even though you have lots of feedback loop, if you are clever enough or if you try to understand the system you want to control and its limits biologically, you can actually end up with, with simple control method to overpass them and uh, to use uh, this uh, stress perturbation, uh, this stress response as a as a mean of control of the gene. So, we will switch organism, we go to bacteria. So just be careful with that because I, I love changing from yeast to bacteria, from yeast again. So we will change again and maybe it will be confusing at one point. We, we use bacteria here because we know how to make a toggle switch in bacteria. Okay, this, there is no more reason than this, at least to we, we, if we were able to do that in yeast, I mean, if, or if it was simple for us, for us to do that in yeast, we would have kept yeast. So here you will see that they will grow in lines like this. It's because we use a, what is called the mother machine. So it's a, it's a microfluidic system in which you have lots, many channels like this and a big channels uh, here in which fluids flow. Uh, and cells they stay actually st uh, in this channel and they simply grow. You will see a movie of that later on. So the toggle switch, we didn't choose it uh, uh, just like this. It's because it's a weak, but still it's an analogy with the inverted pendulum. So the analogy is simply in the fact that it shows an unstable state. Okay, and I will come back to this. But the inverted pendulum, it's a hallmark of control theory. I mean, it's, it's, you, have, you can YouTube uh, uh, control uh, inverted position uh, pendulum. You will end up with lots of uh, movies. You have even great ones where uh, they, they do this with a drone, so it's exactly like Mustafa was showing, but it's a drone that is moving and to try to make a, a stick stay in its upright position. Um, and so the question is, how do we make it uh, stay in the inverted position? So usually I show this movie to show you how it works. So this is an old guy, uh, old, maybe not that old actually, I mean, I'm, I'm getting older and older, so I should be careful with this. Uh, but it has a moustache, so the movie uh, is from, from the past. And he is actually uh, showing you how a control system works, okay? So here he's basically changing the mass of uh, the pendulum and it still works. But I will stop this movie because now I have a way better movie. Yes. <laughs> so we have, uh, it's, it's, it's exactly the same thing, okay? I will update my slides for a little time. Ah, sorry, there is, there is a sound. Uh, anyway, but this is exactly the same problem, okay? It's how, how, how you, have, uh, you are able to make the system move here to make sure that the pendulum stay upright. And so you have a, a sense, probably a sensor of the ang 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 angle here, uh, which, uh, which then is compensated through, through a feedback loop, okay? So in short, we know how to do this. Uh, and, and I guess that if Mustafa has changed the wheels this morning, it would have also works the same way because it is by design made to resist to perturbations from, from outside. Um, so if we come back to a cell, to this, to this toggle switch, how does it work? I'm not sure if you are all familiar with it, but it's, it's relatively simple. So you have these two sets of genes which are mutually repressing each other or inhibiting each other, which makes it fundamentally unstable. So one way to understand it is you, you consider that you have this gene, tet R, and just imagine that there is a bit more of tet R, there is a perturbation that creates a bit more tet R in the cell. 
So it will actually start inhibiting more than usual the production of lac i. So there will be a bit less of lac i. So of course, since you, since you have less lac i, you will leave left the, the inhibition of tet r. So you will actually have a bit more of tet r, and you can see how this is a positive feedback loop actually, and it will it will end up with cells showing mostly this tet r, and so in our case, mostly a green fluorescent protein. And it's a symmetric system, so you have actually exactly the same uh, um, behavior if you have a bit more of uh, like I. So you end up with this kind of uh, diagram where you plot the concentration of like I and Ted R, where you are supposed to see a stable state with, when you, are, you have lots of like I and almost no Ted R, another stable state here, and probably given the, the condition of uh, your toggle switch is right, uh, you can end up with an unstable system. And what's interesting for us, you, you, if you want to control it from outside, you need to have knobs okay, to, to, to play with your system. And we, we, I mean, these genes are, are uh, very interesting because you can add ATC or IPTG, which are going to modulate the repression level uh, the, the, of uh, either TET R or, or like I. So typically, if you put a lot of IPTG, you end up with all cells being green. Put a lot of ATC, you end up with all cells being red. If you don't do anything, you end up with cells which are either green or red. So this is basically the trace of the instability, the natural instability of, uh, of the system. Um, so what we don't have compared to, to the, the previous example is what we are going to try is to try to control cells near this unstable state. But if we want to do this, we first need to have an estimate of where it is because we have, we have no clue where this unstable state is. So very briefly, what you can, you can do is to write a few equations which are going to model your system. So those are very simple, okay? We try to, to, to keep it simple to not have too many parameters, but in short, you transcribe genes and then you translate them into protein. You have a um, uh, lifetime of the different uh, messenger RNA or protein, okay? So, de so degradation. And this is a classic uh, yield function to, uh, to produce, uh, produce uh, either messenger RNA or here a direct relation to produce protein. So this is one model, okay? You can end up with, uh, you do different experiments in which you vary the ATC and IPTG concentration. And then you make a global fit. And on this fit, you are actually able to end up with a good model. And once you have this good model, okay? Which I don't have time to show you here, but you can calibrate and check on uh, uh, different experiments. Uh, you can actually plot the real uh, diagram, that R in function of like I, of the toggle switch that we have. And so you see that this is not as clear as what you get when you, you, you draw a sketch in a, in a, in a textbook, uh, but still you have two stable states and you have a, a point in which the two null clines are actually crossing by and this is an unstable state, state and you can, since you have a model, you can also look in, in a bit more detail that uh, at this position in which what you expect is to have uh, trajectories which are going to get away. Uh, this is the saddle point, uh, get away of this uh, unstable state. So this state exists, but because of the system, you, you, you know you will never see it, or you, you will be very lucky if you see it uh, in your experiments, because cells are not supposed to stay here. They should directly go to one of these two uh, states. Okay, so can we control that? So again, we have to adapt a bit the, uh, the control uh, method that we, well, that we have in our uh, tool set. So this time we are not going to, use, I mean, we are still going to use one computer, but we are going to do two feedback loops uh, at the same time. So this is how you see the same computer. This is just to illustrate that uh, we do two different feedback loops, which are not connected to each other. Okay? So you, have, you are going to monitor GFP and based on this, send IPTG and to monitor RFP and based on this, send ATC, okay? What starts to be interesting to me is that actually they are connected. They are connected by the cell. So we, we start actually to, to study a system which is not really anymore just the cell or just the feedback loop. It's, it's a mix of the two. It's, it's a place where uh, uh, what this feedback loop is going to do will interact with this one, but through the proxy of a cellular system. So it, this is one of the results we got. So a bit of detail. So we are going, going actually to look at this cell here. So we control one cell, 
Okay? And only one cell in this example. This is the cell which is shown as a star here. The intersection of these two uh, straight lines is where we want to control the system. And uh, we still show actually the fluorescence of all the cells which are uh, at, the, at the bottom of the channels here. And you can see at how they explore the state space where, while the IP, ATC and IPG concentration are, are changed. So when you see that, okay, what, what you, you, you see actually is that this cell is constantly pulled back to this uh, system by the control. It doesn't mean it stays exactly at this position. Okay. And it's expected because we have a system which is, uh, you have a lot of inertia in gene expression, even in bacteria. And so whatever you look is actually the fluorescence that was produced 20 minutes before. So this delay actually puts a lot of constraint on how precise we can be uh, in time. But still, it will remain like this and it can remain at, at least as long as our experiments last, so typically 15 hours. You have to compare this time to uh, either the typical, oh yeah, typically the growth rate of bacteria, so 30 minutes, uh, a bit more in our, in our system. So you can stop looking at a movie, you can look at what cells are doing. So this is a trajectory of the cell which is controlled, and those are the GFP and RFP uh, signals that are controlled. And you can already see that the GFP is way better controlled than the RFP, which shows a lot of oscillations. And we actually, I'm not, we, we had hypothesis on uh, how fast the drug can enter the cell. I'm not completely sure that we, we pinpoint the, the right reason for how this, uh, I mean, what causes those, those oscillations. So you can do different control experiments. This is done with a PI controller, so the one that you listened to this morning. Uh, and in orange is the cell that we control, but we can see also other black curves, which are the other cells. We, we don't really base our control feedback loop on the state, but we can, we can still monitor them and, and, and plot this. And we can also use a different control strategy, um, which is very, very simple, very brutal. Uh, it's called a bang-bang controller. So, so in short, if you are below the threshold, you activate your gene. If you are above the threshold, you stop activating. Okay. So it gives this kind of uh, pulses uh, uh, kind of, uh, of system. And you can see again that in, in some occasions, I mean, many of the cells are actually following the, the, the control, although we don't base our control on, on, uh, on, their, uh, on their state. So we, we actually tried to wonder why it was like this. Uh, and we remembered actually, uh, by discussing from, with, with friends uh, in, um, from the, the, the US, level team ring to be precise, uh, we actually remembered the fact that there is uh, this so-called Kapitza inverted pendulum, which is a beautiful physics experiment, uh, which tells you that, of course, you can use all kinds of control theory to stabilize an inverted pendulum. You can also just make its, its basis vibrate very quickly. So very quickly, again, compared to what? Very, I mean, compared to the frequency of the pendulum, okay? which depends on the length and the mass of the pendulum. So when you do this, uh, and you can actually carry on on the equations. You actually change the phase, the stability of, of the of the inverted position. It, it is now a stable thing. So you can see in the movie, at one point the, the guy is, I, mean, I guess it's a guy, is pushing on the pendulum, and it, it comes back, pushes, and it comes back to the thing. Okay. So of course, when you see this, I mean, the question is, can we do the same thing with bacteria? Knowing again that the analogy is obviously uh, not perfect, here you don't have the equivalent of ATC and IPTG. Okay? Uh, this is, uh, it's not exactly a linear system, but when you are close to the uh, unstable, I mean, now stable state, it is actually, you can linearize everything as Mustafa showed. Whereas the toggle switch is highly nonlinear, so things are a, a bit different. But still, we can try. So we try. So again, we try, I show you the movie that works. Before that, the, the PhD in charge, so Jean-Baptiste Lugan, who is now doing his, his postdoc in uh, Marie Benzlop lab in Boston. Uh, he, he needed to search for parameters that actually allow to do that. Uh, and so you can see here that you have two different uh, inputs. And so the frequency is the same for the two inputs, okay? But the duty cycle, so how much, the proportion of one with, compared to the other, actually, uh, this he needed to, to, to calibrate. 
And so I'm going to wait for the movie to start again. So we don't have an arrow. So because we don't, this is open loop, okay? There is no feedback loop at all. All cells are going to somehow stay in the same space. They oscillate, so they don't stay completely fixed. Again, it's a system with inertia and we partially know them. But what's actually interesting is what happens at the very end here when we stop the oscillation, okay? This is what I think is the most important part of the experiment. When you stop the oscillation, you will see that cells actually start committing to their fate. We are not vibrating anymore the pendulum, it's getting back to its unstable uh, state and actually it falls down on one side or another, which was illustrated here by the red and green uh, state. So again, same kind of uh, illustration, but now with numbers, not only in movies. So here you can see the trajectory of the cells. So those actually show the oscillations around the stable state. And this is what happens when you release the, the oscillation. And actually you see that some go to the red and some go to, to the green state. You can go back to your model, you can, because we have a model of this system. And in a model, you can do this for how long as you want. And so it will keep oscillating for a very long time before uh, when you release, uh, before actually committing to a different state. So we were very happy about that. And you can actually start varying the duty cycle, but I, I actually don't know how long they are, but I don't think I have time to do this. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Please. So it's very interesting what you show. Uh, the I, I, I don't have a mic for you. So if I can think of the analogy to the inverted pendulum, mm -hmm. um, I mean, in control theory, one can show that you can stabilize multiple pendula yeah. on one part, yes. one input, but only provided they have different lengths. So if they have all the same length, that's the single point where the system loses controllability. That's it matter, true. right? So you want use uh, many forces with higher frequencies or lower frequencies to simultaneously uh, stabilize multiple it's, so it's due to coupling through inertia or it has nothing to do no, with it? No, 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 for example, you know, if, if they all have the same length and they, one moves to the right, the other one moves to the left, what it takes to stabilize one will destabilize the other. They, okay. they respond similarly. Whereas if you have one really short one and one really long one, you can use high frequencies to stabilize the short one and lower frequencies simultaneously okay, cool. to do the, the top cool, one. Cool, cool. So here, if you have genetically identical cells, I mean, theoretically, yeah, yeah, yeah. it should be impossible to be able to stabilize them all to the same point with one input or yeah. input like this. Whereas the Fitzer pendulum is actually not a problem because you do yeah. this open loop and they all see the same. Yeah. Um, no, very interesting. Very yeah, interesting. So I, I think. Um, if, you, if they are genetically, if they're not identical, then some are. But then phenoty phenotypically, they will not, they will never be identical. Yeah, so you have, you have noise. But also, you have so many cells to do it, yeah. to do it with feedback. So in a way, the, the only way to do this is with the Kapitza open loop thing. But there, the only thing you lose is that you have to live with oscillations. Because you have you're to. Not, yes. You're not stabilizing exactly to no. the point, but you have to kind of move around. No, no, absolutely, you're right. And, and, and again, for this, I mean, not only you are not stabilizing exactly to the point, but also because you have many different cells, because they are not exactly alike, they all have their own uh, stable, uh, unstable, exactly. and now stable exactly. point. So, say, so the, the stable point around which we are stabilizing is actually. A, uh, art and fiction, fiction. I mean, doesn't really exist. I mean, this is a result of a, a model. So, stabilizing for one cell in this yeah. case should work, but maybe not for too many at the same time. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, this is why it is great to have Mustafa, because then you, you can get new ideas. Um, so, last example, a bit more recent, uh, and, I, and I need to give you a bit of feedback, and so I, I will do this again, switching between bacteria and yeast. So, I will first give you a bit of feedback on, on I mean, a bit of context, sorry, on the feedback. No feedback here, just context. Uh, on what I'll call range expansion in microfluidic, which is what you, you, you see here. So many cells invading, so this is a time lapse, okay? Invading a, a small channel. And then we'll try to see how we can try to control it. And again, uh, what kind of ideas this, uh, this generate. Um, 
So it, it comes from a, a very, very basic question. So here we are not going to look really at uh, control of gene expression. We want to ask a simple question. If we look at yeast, bacteria, whatever cells, and you want to model how they grow, okay? This is relatively straightforward if you look at it in, uh, in bulk, okay, in liquid. You can make lots of assumptions, but in, in short, what it means is that you, you, you know that you have a, an average growth rate, so cells are going to divide every now and then, okay? And this is the key parameter that, that allows you to uh, very simply explain that the, you should have an exponential growth, okay? So one parameter, and even if you have variation in this, I mean, this, is, is, this goes relatively easy. If you look at what's happening now on a petri dish, okay, when you have this time the same cells, but they, they actually, uh, they are not uh, mixed in a liquid, they, they invade as a colony, so they invade specially. Uh, then now it's, it's a bit more difficult. So those are the same cells, okay, so, so you can still have the same parameter, this mu, I mean, which is a growth rate here. So you know that all of these cells, if they were placed in the same conditions, they are supposed to grow, so for yeast, every 90 minutes. I mean, it depends on the nutrients. For bacteria, every 30 minutes. Again, depending on the, on the, on the conditions. Uh, but if I were to ask you what kind of equation you can write or how, how fast this range, uh, this colony is, is going to, to invade the petri dish, then it's, it's a bit more tricky because you, you, are, you have many things that you, you miss, okay? What you need here is to know how many cells are growing. Not all cells in the colony are growing because what you can see in a petri dish is that cells are not growing exponentially fast, okay? It would be a nightmare for experimentalists if in a petri dish cells were growing exponentially fast. They are actually, when you look at experiments, they are more likely to grow linearly and then at one point they stop, okay? And this is, this should be, a, this should not come as a surprise. It, you have gradient of nutrients. Cells are actually consuming glucose. At the, at the front, and at the back, uh, they are actually sitting in places where there is less glucose or even metabolic waste, which makes them grow a bit, uh, a bit slower or not grow at all. You have the same problem, I mentioned glucose, but you have the same problem with oxygen, with amino acids, all kinds of nutrients. So lots of gradients here. So if you were to make a model of the progression of this, you would need to know the gradients of all kinds of nutrients, which means you would need to know for cells how fast they absorb nutrients, how fast they metabolize them, and uh, what is the, the, the growth rate which results for this. I don't, I don't know what's happening. Okay. Okay, anyway. So it's, it's, it's not that trivial, actually. Okay, we know what equations to write, but uh, in, in a sense, we, we are missing lots of parameters. Um, and it, it turns also to be a nightmare to solve, actually. If you want to solve this in 3D with diffusion and everything, it's obviously possible, I mean, but it, it's going to take some time. Uh, so we started to look at a simplified version of this and to try just to look at how gradients are formed in colonies. So here you can see uh, yeast cells okay, growing in channels. And so this is exactly like the mother machine system that you saw, except it's... it's Sorry for the noise, I don't know what to do with this, maybe. Up. I hope it will be better. Um, so you, you just need to look at... at uh, uh, it's this one, you think? Okay. Okay. Anyway, so, so the difference with the mother machine is that it's, it's way longer, because the mother machine was a few bacteria long, so let's say 10, 15 micrometer. Here it's typically one millimeter, it's a bit less than one millimeter, and, and you can see that you have lots of cells in there. And you can also see the gradients by the naked eye, so you can see that cells at the back, they don't grow, cells at the front in this area, they actually, they are growing happily. Okay, so you have a gradient of growth, between cells at the front, the, the fluid is coming from there, so nutrients are coming from the bottom, and cells at the back when, when nothing uh, is growing. And you can start thinking of many different, uh, actually interesting things, in, in, in more in ecology, I mean, things which are known, um, in which what matters now is not necessarily the growth rate of individual cells, it's, it's, it's a mix between the growth rate and the absorption rate of glucose. So th this sketch, okay, it's just a, a way to make you understand this. You can imagine, let's start with, uh, yeah, okay, so forget about this high and low glucose, this is not the point here. You can imagine having cells that grow 
very fast. Okay, they have a very high growth rate. Because they have a high growth rate, they also need to consume very fast glucose. And because they, they consume this glucose, the gradient of glucose is going to be very sharp, okay? okay? Just limited to a few layers of cells at the beginning of the channel. And so the cells will not grow after this. So the resultant, the, the, the total growth of your system is this number of cells times their growth rate, okay? And you can actually have cells which are growing much slowly, so they, they would actually be outcompeted by these ones in, uh, in the bulk. But because they grow slowly, they also consume glucose very slowly, so glucose has actually the possibility to diffuse very far in the colony, and of course this is only uh, an example, and, and, and uh, it's, not, it's, it's uh, just a, a way of presenting things, but you could end up with a cell which is growing much more slowly, but as the resultant, the, the total growth is actually the same than this one. So what you call fitness, the propensity of cells to actually dominate over their neighbors, is very different in the bulk, in what you do in your, in your, when you grow cells uh, in the lab, when, uh, than what you do when you grow cells in a petri dish or when they are growing in an ecosystem, okay? So something very simple. You can go a bit Further, so this, this was for Peter Swain, okay, because we, we, we share with Peter the, the love of uh, HXT, so exhaust transporter. Uh, and uh, you can also look at how glucose is actually uh, uh, consumed uh, in, in these systems by looking, for example, at HXT7 in fluorescence. And you would see that actually you have a band appearing here. Okay? So this band is at the transition between growth and no growth, and this is where mostly HXT7 which is supposed to be expressed when you have low glucose, is actually uh, used. And you can look at this position, this peak, and depending on how much glucose you have in your uh, bottom channel, okay, which is again flowing, so replenishing every now and then, uh, you will have this uh, frontier which is pushed further and further away in the system. So this is one of the proofs that there is actually gradient of glucose. But again, not only glucose, everything. Here we only look at and glucose. You can do this with different HXTs, just going relatively quickly, yes, very quickly. Uh, and you, you see exactly the same thing again you see in, in, in patterning in uh, embryos or in different things. You have gradient of landscape of gene expression, which are this time the, the reflect of how the environment is changed by the cells themselves. So they actually consume glucose, they do this by their own, and uh, this result in uh, uh, gene expression. So you have this uh, emergence of, uh, of patterns uh, due to the, the uh, behavior of each single cell. So HXT1, for example, uh, which is expressed in high glucose, will be expressed in, in, the, in the entry only. HXT5, which is a marker of, uh, uh, it's expressed when cells don't grow, for example, will be exp will expressed mostly at the back, etc., etc. Same thing, respiration at the back, where there is low glucose, uh, fermentation at the front when you have lots of uh, glucose, which is classic for, for yeast. So you've seen that, okay, and, and the question is, okay, can we try to control somehow not a single cell growth rate, but the, this, uh, 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 the velocity at which the front is actually uh, uh, progressing? Um, so I'm going to switch to bacteria. I'm going to switch to bacteria for a simple reason. As you have seen from Peter's talk, uh, Glucose is actually something complex in yeast, and it's still unclear for us which gene we would like to control to actually have a, a way to play with uh, the, the colony. But in bacteria, th there is a strain from uh, friends in Grenoble, uh, so uh, uh, Hans Geiselman and Ida de Jong, which is, which is great because it, it shows a very sharp transition between no growth or growth depending on uh, IPTG, which is our favorite drug uh, in, in bacteria. And so why it does this? It does this because they actually, they, they placed one part, the, the beta subunit of the RNA polymerase under the control of IPTG. So if you don't place IPTG, you don't produce polymerase and cells need polymerase to grow. And so you end up, so this is from their paper, you end up with this kind of very sharp transition between no growth or growth depending on the presence of IPTG. And the cool thing of this compared to nutrients, what I just showed you before, is that you will also have a gradient, but you don't have all the same problem with metabolic activity that would be generated by glucose. So we have something which is a bit uh, more synthetic to, to the thing. So still, ca can we try to use this to, to control not a cell, but a population? So same uh, 
systems and usual. So this is Dimitri Milinov who is doing this and he's sitting right there in the room. And uh, we have this chip. Uh, we can control as usual the mix uh, of uh, liquid you want to send. So LV and IPTG and make any concentration you want. Uh, and we are just going to use two different reservoirs, one with full IPTG, one with no IPTG. And we'll use what is called pulse width modulation. So you mix these fluids at a given uh, uh, frequency and with a given duty cycle to actually reach any concentration you want of uh, IPTG. And we have this uh, uh, computer to try to, it, it can be a Mac actually, but we, we are mostly uh, working with, uh, uh, with PC. Um, and uh, so we still need one thing is to look at, to have an output. Okay, so you still need to be able to measure this velocity. And so one way to do this is to define different areas and to look at PIVs. Okay, so you can look, so particle image velocimetry. Very briefly, you compare two pictures, one time after another in timeless microscopy. You look at the difference between these two pictures, and that gives you uh, an idea. You can measure the velocity of change uh, in, in, uh, in this fact. So you, you, you end up with this kind of picture for bacteria this time, where you see that it's growing faster here than uh, up, I mean, than, than far away from nutrients. And you can measure this kind of velocity profile. So this is how velocity uh, evolves in function of the position in the channel. So this is zero. Zero is the bottom. And as when you, you go deeper and deeper, so with less and less uh, IPTG available, you end up with uh, no growth uh, at the back. And for different concentration of IPTG. Okay. And th there is something that we, we still don't fully understand, but which I think is very interesting, that you, you, this velocity here is uh, these arrows here, but you can actually theoretically infer the growth rate of cells in function of this velocity. Because if this velocity, what it is, you have to understand that if the cell is growing here, it will push all cells which are uh, below. Okay, so actually the velocity at the back is the integral of all growth rates above it. So if you take the derivative of the velocity, so the derivative of this curve, you end up with the local growth rate of your system. So you can, so it's, it's noisy, it's difficult, but you, you can somehow measure it. And you can then plot the growth rate as a function of velocity, and all those curves collapse on one, one curve, okay? Where you see that the velocity uh, the derivative in, in, in space, of course, of the velocity uh, goes, I mean, is linearly with uh, the growth rate. So you have this, I will come back to this because I think it's interesting. And, and uh, Mathieu, you stop me when uh, it's time. Five minutes, okay. Uh, so it's, there's not, not, not much to show as an experiment because looking at, uh, I mean, velocity is not as uh, visual. Uh, as fluorescence. Uh, so I directly show you uh, this graph, which is a control experiment, so the kind of thing that we can do, which works. So you want to uh, force your collection of cells to collectively have an output, the maximum velocity of uh, one micrometer per minute, I mean, a bit more. And uh, the green curve is the estimate you make at the end of the channel. And those are the pulses of IPTG. Okay? When it goes up, you stop sending IPTG. When it goes down, you're actually sending IPTG. You can see, for example, here that it's down, so you send IPTG because you are uh, below the, the threshold. And this is a bang-bang controller, so there is no, uh, no magic trick in terms of uh, control theory. And what I think is very interesting is that you can then compare closed loop and open loop. So you have this curve, which I told you we don't really understand. But still, there is a relationship between the growth rate and the velocity. For open loop, okay, this is the same curve than before. For closed loop, it's a different curve. Very, very, very different curve. And you can also try to infer what would be, so this is the velocity, the growth rate, sorry, as a function of the position, okay, inferred. And uh, you can try to compare it with uh, what would be the same experiment uh, with uh, IPTG concentration and you would see something, again, very different. The profile of speed is very different. So why it is interesting? Because it's, it's one, I think, um, another way to tell you that we are not really looking at uh, a collection of cells anymore. We, we are looking at, at, at a full system in which the computer and the cells are actually doing something which, which is emerging from their interaction. And, and I think this is something 
which uh, I think it's, best, it's, it's, really, it's great, okay? scientifically very interesting. Um, it's probably also what is behind uh, cybernetics and then cybergenetics, that you, you don't simply consider one system and another. You are actually creating interfaces between the two. And it's due to the interface between the two that you are going to change the robustness, the dynamics, the stability, and you're actually going to improve uh, your system in the end. And so this is really what I call bio-hybrid system, but there's the kind of thing that we are trying to understand. And, and controlling a complex system like the range expansion is actually one way to, to outline uh, the effect of a control to uh, uh, an otherwise uh, uh, already complex uh, biological uh, system. Um, yes, I will still use two minutes for, for two, two very, I mean, one conclusion and one idea. So the conclusion is that, so I, I actually, talk you through the different system from the control of a very, I mean, very con simple control of a fluorescent protein uh, to a collection of cells, okay? Uh, no optogenetics, but of course, you can uh, pick your system of choice and start uh, playing with a different kind of input, and so you can send light instead of IPTG. You need to have, uh, you need to make the strains, but this is something that is now, uh, now possible, and the different people in the team are actually working on uh, uh, other kind of systems where this time we use optogenetics to, to activate them. Um, so there are different interests to make them. One of them is actually this is the last idea I would like you to take home, actually, the fact that we are now studying not cells, not computers, but uh, hybrid systems uh, in between them. Uh, and so more, more practically, uh, control is fun. We can also use this to revisit a bit the way we do experiments in biology. So this is what, we call, what I call augmented or, or conditional microscopy. You'll see it's very simple. It takes one, one second to explain. What, what we are doing, what we have been, what I've showed you many, many different times, is actually we are exactly doing this, okay? We look at something, and depending on what we see, we do, we do this. So you can uh, now consider that, uh, forget about controlling gene expression, forget about control, actually, of a biological system. Just think of applying this in your experiments. So when I see a cell dividing, or if a cell is dividing, then uh, send an antibiotic, a drug, uh, press, apply a force, uh, shine on cells, I mean, whatever. Uh, when the number of cells which is that value, and I know that there will be that many interactions or there will be gradient, then change the environment to actually look at my system. All of these are really reasonable rich. I mean, there are now several systems that, uh, uh, software systems that allows you to do this. And it can really change the, the very classic way we do experiment, which is time lapse, so what is called multidimensional acquisition, where you define the, the colors you want to look at, so GFP, RFP, bright field, and then you loop every uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, and you look at the same thing every time, and you have no way to, to, to change things if a condition happens. And when you think of it, this is a bit crazy to continue doing 10, 20 hours experiments and wait the end to finally uh, know if you are going to be able to do something, okay? Another very basic example of that is if I see a bubble in my microfluidic device, stop the experiment. And then, very suddenly, uh, for the person doing the experiment, it's one more day to do an experiment because you can if not come back to the lab, which I mean, everyone does what he wants, but you can actually uh, do, uh, uh, um, try to stop the experiment or, or, or simply disregard it. And of course, you can imagine all kinds of tools like uh, online tools to play uh, with this system. So you get the idea. We are, we are actually working on it. So we, we as others, actually, with the same tool that we use for uh, uh, these control loops, uh, so we have a different system in which we can actually control the all sets of the computers and based on image analysis decide what to do. So we have different proof of concept. I'll just show you one, uh, which is very basic, which, which starts to work now. It's to look at uh, yeast cells, okay? And what we're going to do is to predict when there is a cell division. So we look at cells and prediction is relatively simple for now. So all of this is done with deep learning and all these new fancy tools to segment cells. but uh, uh, th th this is relatively simple for the, the if part. Uh, it's, we observed over different experiments that the size of the bud is actually a good indicator of uh, the fact that there will be mitosis in a, in a given number of time, I mean, window of time after this. So we just look at this, okay, we scan all cells, and when we predict that there will be uh, a mitosis, 
we zoom on one cell or we stop actually taking pictures elsewhere and we switch to RFP to look, for example, at this uh, HTB2, so uh, histones, which actually allow you to look at the nucleus. And we can see the, the mitosis as relatively high resolution. And we don't risk bleaching the cell because we, we never shine RFP unless we are sure that we want to study uh, this very uh, even. So I, I, this kind of ideas, I mean, I can go uh, forever, so I will stop, but this is really the kind of thing that I think uh, uh, can uh, uh, help everyone uh, to do better experiment and also to start looking with more precision to uh, uh, systems which are rare. So rare in time, so division happens, uh, uh, it takes a few minutes for 90 minutes uh, uh, cycle of life uh, in yeast, uh, or uh, rare in space, you can imagine uh, trying to scan for cells which are a bit bigger or a bit smaller or doing something a bit uh, fancy in their phenotype and catch them to be able to study them. Okay, and I will stop there with the team and some of them are here, so uh, don't hesitate to discuss with them afterwards. Thank you. So thanks a lot, uh, Pascal. Uh, we have really time for uh, one or two questions. Mustafa. That was a very beautiful uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is this. So when you were showing the relationship between velocity and growth, mm -hmm. you made a very convincing argument that, you know, when the cells are growing fast, they push the cells below, and so the velocity is increased, and so then you can kind of understand the reason of that relationship. But that argument is a very physical argument. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with whether the cells are being controlled or not. So how do you reconcile these two? Because when you, when you looked at the feedback, the closed loop, you showed a different relationship. Yes, so I, I can only say yes, and so we, we, we are trying to understand this, okay? I, I don't exactly understand what, what the one way to understand, I mean, not understand, but to have a hint of what's happening is that, uh, again, cells, they process information, okay? And they are not in a steady state because they are constantly seeing a variation of IPTG with no IPTG, full IPTG, no IPTG. And our understanding is that because of that, it creates very different growth rate profile. Uh, in, in the system. But we, we are at this stage, this is a two weeks uh, old uh, kind of experiment. I would be delighted to discuss this with you uh, a bit more. Yeah. And of course, this is done with IPTG. The, 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 the really cool stuff to me, I mean, once we have a, a bit more underst I mean, understanding of that, would be to go back to uh, glucose, which is a natural uh, metabolic source for, for, for yeast or bacteria, actually, and to try to, to do exactly the same experiment. So is there any other questions in the audience? No? So if not, maybe let's thank Pascal again. Thank you.